Stop acting so small because you are the universe in ecstatic motion. On va commencer la deuxième conférence média qu'on a prévue ici. Elle est un peu particulière, je vais faire l'intro en français très rapidement et ensuite on va passer en anglais. On va interviewer une journaliste, un journaliste ukrainien et une activiste ukrainienne qui ont monté un podcast qui s'appelle « Ukrainian Spaces ». Euh, L'an dernier, en février, euh, à peu près 15, 15 jours, 3 semaines euh, après le début de l'invasion. Euh, ils vont nous en parler, on va leur poser euh, quelques questions, on a une demi-heure euh, avec eux. Euh, L'idée, c'est que moi, j'utilise un quart d'heure pour euh, lancer la conversation. S'il y a des questions dans la salle, euh, surtout, n'hésitez pas à lever votre main. Vous pouvez poser les questions en anglais. Vous pouvez aussi absolument poser euh, vos questions en français. Euh, je ferai la traduction, il n'y a, a aucun souci. Euh, on va regarder maintenant si... Ils sont connectés et si tout se passe bien. Super. Hi Valeria, hi Maxime. Hi. Can you hear me well? Yes, perfect. Awesome. So we're all here. I just introduced uh, uh, the podcast uh, a little bit in uh, in French, but I think it would be so much better to to hear from from you guys. So my first my first question is really, uh, you know, like how did uh, Ukrainian spaces start? Like what was the, uh, the 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 trigger for for you, and what did you have in mind when you when you recorded that very first uh, episode? Thank you so much for having us, first of all. We're very grateful to have the opportunity to talk to everyone about our podcast and our country more broadly because, um, you know, the war is ongoing and it's important to keep it at the top of the news agenda for, for people across the world. So we're very grateful for this opportunity. But in terms of um, why we started this podcast, we, Maxim and I actually only knew each other from Twitter and we, you know, would exchange a couple of messages um, now and then, but we basically essentially, when the war kicked off on the 24th of February, um, we started messaging a bit more uh, in depth about the fact that we were very worried that we were seeing a lot of people who were not Ukrainian, the usual Russia expert who, you know, is all on all the rosters of all the usual, usual television channels. And we were very worried that we were being um, misrepresented, that we were being spoken for, that Ukrainians weren't being heard. Um, and, you know, after the 24th of February, it was a matter of survival for us. We knew that we had to speak for ourselves and we knew that we had to create a platform to allow Ukrainians to also speak for themselves because there are so many incredible Ukrainians who, uh, you know, speak so many different languages from English to French to Italian and who have specialisms in so many different areas from art to philosophy to, you know, many different things that can explain to the world why what is happening in Ukraine is not just about the 24th of February, but it's actually a long history of fighting against Russian imperialism. So yep. Max and I, in a very short way, had a Twitter DM and we were like, okay, let's do this. Let's start it. And At that point, Twitter Spaces was a big thing, and we knew that Twitter was prioritizing Twitter Spaces. Obviously, the situation has changed, so we were like, okay, let's just start doing Twitter Spaces three times a week, and that's how we started, essentially. And, and what were you doing just before the, the podcast, and, and, and maybe that you're still doing today, like uh, aside from the podcast? Um, yeah, of course. 
I was uh, global head of digital engagement at Amnesty International at the Secretariat. Um, and before that, I was the global social media editor for Newsweek magazine. And I'll pass to Maxim. Yeah, and um, basically I had uh, over a decade experience of uh, covering Eastern and Central uh, Europe for global audiences as a journalist. But, you know, this is not still not our full-time uh, uh, job because as many Ukrainians, we do have our regular jobs. We need to, to be also engaged in uh, a dozen or so uh, volunteer efforts because it feels like for every Ukrainian, it feels like we have a task to represent and claim any platform because part of the reason why genocide is happening is that Ukrainian voices have been ignored and not heard for way too long and the empire was talking on behalf of us instead of people were not listening to what we actually have to say. And, and Maxim, so um, Valeria was talking about the fact that you, you started on Twitter space because initially you felt like that was the, the right platform, it was getting the, the, the right promotion uh, at the time. There is also on Twitter space like an element of you know, interaction on the platform, like you can actually interact with the public in a way that's completely different from a, a podcast that you listen to, you know, like a few hours after it's been, uh, it's been recorded. Can you tell us how were the first Twitter spaces that you organized? Like was, what was the, uh, how important was it for you, like as, as speakers and people that were uh, uh, speaking as well as like for people listening? Well, I think like partially it's a, it's a choice of format. Uh, for me as a journalist, I always love live conversations and uh, not recorded broadcasts because it brings a bit of uh, um, spontaneity and, you know, a, a, a bit of, uh, you know, makes it extra alive. And it was also important as a format for bringing our guests so they as we promise them that they will amplify them absolutely uncensored in a very safe space where Ukrainians can explain Ukraine and explain things about their Ukrainianness to the outside world and feeling safe about it because unfortunately a lot of platforms for Ukrainians are still to the date, even more than a year into genocide, are not feeling safe. But also, uh, the you know, we had to also be very creative because unfortunately, all content on most social media platforms about Ukraine to this very date is being deprioritized or shadow banned. So you need to find those platforms and those opportunities that, you know, for example, at that time, Twitter Spaces was something, as Valeria mentioned, was pushed by the algorithm and prioritized. Now, we're diversifying. Twitter Spaces is not our main priority platform, uh, but at the same time, it's it's a bit exhausting that you need to find everyday new ways to be heard because uh, some algorithms and some platforms do not like to you to for you to be very outspoken, specifically on the topic of uh, uh, genocide and war in Ukraine. Yeah, absolutely. Can you can you walk us through? Um, uh, a, a, an episode, like what an episode is, uh, who you usually invite on the show, the type of conversations you're having in the in the podcast, and if it evolved from like the very first to what you do today, of course, if you have seen a, a change. Yeah, sure. Um, I think, as always with these things, with live shows, and I've actually learned a lot from Maxim as well, because Maxim used to do live broadcasts. I don't have that experience. Um, and so, you know, there's much more that goes into the planning of each episode than it may seem. Um, I think we've started doing even more of it because I think, you know, it seems like it's strange to plan for a live uh, kind of relaxed conversation, but it, actually planning allows you to have a safer space because people kind of know the questions around um, the topics that they'll be talking about. And so actually Maxim does a lot of the preparation for each of our episodes. So finding the people, um, we like to highlight different voices, you know, from different perspectives, because again, Russian imperialism has an, a, a sort of a, to understand Russian imperialism, you have to understand it through the lens of intersectionality and the way that it has an effect on different people within the Ukrainian society and outside of it. So Maxim has been doing a lot of work in terms of finding those people who would be really beneficial to the outside world to hear um, and then kind of figuring out what's safe for them 
in terms of interaction with us in our space. And then the podcast itself, we always um, we have like a golden rule, I think, which I, is very important for us, which is that we ask people to introduce themselves and to tell people what they think is important about themselves. And to me, that actually sets like a really good um vibe for a lack of a better word because it really allows for our guests to set the tone of the conversation and the direction of the conversation and we actually started um doing one hour episodes as i said uh three times three times a week so imagine how much prep and sort of uh work that was and also but now we've started doing a little bit less because the other side of it is that there's of course a lot of work to be done as well after the broadcast is live. So I'll let Maxim tell you a little bit more as well about the post-production and um, how important that is as well. I, I think we always wanted to focus our byline is to amplify the diverse Ukrainian voices and decolonize conversations about Ukraine. And, you know, we didn't want to do a conversation that about Ukraine that would be like anything else we, you can see on mainstream media, especially abroad. And we wanted to center human stories and Ukrainians first. Of course, during the episode, they can educate you more on the issues, I don't know, of Ukrainian nationalism or Russian language in Ukraine or queerness in Ukraine and so on. But we wanted to first to center their own stories because this... Uh, uh, this genocide made so every innate Ukrainian to rethink what it means to be Ukrainian and what we're actually fighting for. And in most cases, it's all about the values. So our favorite question we have on a podcast, what it means for you to be Ukrainian? And I can tell you that after 60 more, uh, 60 plus episodes, there wasn't a single saying question, uh, answer to this question. Ev everyone gives such a powerful but different answer to this question. And personally, for me, this is a manifestation of re what it really means to be Ukrainian, this diversity. But at the same time, you know, everybody finds their Ukrainianness in their own unique spot. But what connects us is a feeling of this community. So, you know, on even the most darkest days, we go into episode and there's absolutely horrible things that happened that day. And we all feel down and you can hear in our voices. But then after that conversation, we're all empowered and uplifted because it also serves as a bit of a therapy space for many Ukrainians as well. I, I think that's extremely interesting what you just said, because for those who haven't listened to your podcast yet, just to be super clear, like you're not talking about um, the conflict itself from a news perspective. You're not covering like what's happening. You're truly on while it started around that time around like uh, uh last uh, march um march of last year you're actually having conversation about all the topics that you just discussed like what it means to uh um to be ukrainian and and inviting like a um a, a very diverse set of, of folks you have also been inviting um um, folks from other countries uh, beyond Ukraine, but that are facing the same uh, Russian col colonization uh, issue. Can you talk a bit about that part? Like you talked about a therapy session, uh, that's, that's for you, but it feels like it also applies to some of the guests that you are inviting on the show that are actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, beyond Ukraine. Yeah. Um, I think, as I said, to understand Russian imperialism, we need to look and at, at, at the way that Russia has influenced what's happening in a lot of countries uh, that, that border Russia and also outside, we need to understand it through the lens of sort of intersectionality and solidarity as well. And by the way, this is not a new phenomenon. You know, Ukrainian literary figures from Taras Shevchenko and, and after him have been talking about the solidarity between, you know, people in Ukraine, people in the Caucasus and people in all the sort of ex-Russian colonies as well. And so for, for us, it's extreme. And to be honest, it's we found it extremely powerful um, and benef not beneficial, but it, the conversations have been so beneficial to us in terms of learning more about ourselves with people from other countries. You know, so our, our Georgian um, colleagues we've had on our podcast and and we've had people from many different places that have experienced um, 
a lot of the negative consequences of Russian imperialism, imperialism on themselves. And I think it's both important for us, but it's also important for our audiences because by connecting the dots and by showing how our experiences have been shared, it really allows us to highlight that this is sort of not a, no, a new phenomenon. It's not Ukraine specific and it's actually a real global problem. And to a degree also Maxim and I learn from the people how to deal with a lot of these um, consequences of Russia's colonial rule ourselves. Um, because I think what we found extremely powerful is this sort of knowledge exchange between different people with different experiences from different countries about how to move forward. And the other thing I was going to say is that our podcast has always had a hope based approach to telling the story, right? No matter how horrendous the day has been for us and our countries, um, we always like to talk about the fact that there is a possibility to change this and people before us have tried to change it and we are now in the driving seat of this change. And I think this hope approach has been super important for us, but it's also been important for those people who we've invited, as you say, from, from other countries as well, um, because it really, I think hope is what allows us to connect um, in that respect. So yeah, Maxim, I don't know if there's Anything you as well? I think to quickly add, so imagine the uh, you know the the full scale invasion and genocide starts, and we just do these three episodes per week, pouring out everything complex complex feelings and complex emotions and survival stories that people want to share with the world. But at the same point, we started seeing so many allies coming and helping Ukraine and amplifying Ukrainian voices from so many places. And of course, like I've been working on the topic of Russian colonialism even before genocide started, but this human connection that we saw and we started doing these episodes as we call them bridge episodes to Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and South Sudan and you know other countries uh, outside Europe. And you come to an episode and you share these very personal stories of personal decolonization, personal stories taking back control of who you are, telling your own stories. And it's one thing um, when Ukrainians are heard and some people dismiss our voices, you know, oh, they're, you know, experiencing war, genocide, they're emotional, whatever, whatnot. This is a very popular way to dismiss the Ukrainian voices these days. But then you see when other voices from Kazakhstan or from other Russian former colonies come and say the same thing, and they come from very diverse, different backgrounds. And this is what clicks with our audience. And they're like, uh-huh. So it's probably not just Ukrainians. It's probably not just 2022. It happened before. It, it happened to other people. Maybe there is a bigger problem that we're dealing with and not just uh, internal, as some people say, conflict between just two countries. Yeah, or even external conflict, uh, as in, you know, big superpowers fighting each other. No, we have our own history and we have our own history of Russian domination in the region and outside, which we want to highlight and show that we are fighting against something we've been fighting for for a very long time. And and, and on that note, um, where do you think, so you, the, you started the podcast about a year ago, like a, a, a little over a year ago now. And you started exactly as you described it. It was like Ukraine, very much 2022. Uh, and the first episodes were about um, all those uh, uh, complex feelings and emotion, just as the, not the war started, because the war started in, in, in 2014, but like that new phase of the uh, full-blown invasion. Um, and then, you know, as the, uh, the months went on and the episode uh, went on, as you described, like you, you started inviting like more people on your show and you started expanding the conversation to, you know, like the larger uh, Ukrainian identity as, a, as one topic and also um, uh, Russian uh, colonization as, as, a, as a larger topic as well. Where do you see your podcast? And I'm saying podcast, but maybe you have like different uh, uh, things in mind in terms of media. But how, how do you see your role in one year? Like what you would do in one year, like where you would take this uh, uh, this mission, uh, uh, where where you would want to go. Well, I, I think like the first and foremost, uh, we need to emphasize that it's still a volunteer project. So we're 100% supported by donations, and we're so grateful that from the day first we had 
so many people showing up at our Patreon page and supporting it and allow us to, you know, to grow a team because as Valeria mentioned, to do a good show, you need a good team and um, research and production as well. So this is still uh, uh, very much needed and support is very much needed and is a long-term goal and long-term mission because imagine hundreds of years all the Ukrainian stories have been told not by Ukrainians, but through the Russian uh, imperial colonial lenses, by Russians. Our family stories, our history, our even identity was explained back to the world by Russians, but not by us. So not in a one year or five years, you can correct that easily. More stories need to be heard. Uh, more Ukrainian stories and perspectives should be uh, outside there and more Ukrainians should be invited to claim those platforms, especially as the genocide is still happening. But for us, uh, of course, we want to scale things up. Uh, we have started, started doing live events as well because we found that it's so powerful and important to have a conversation, especially complicated conversations when people actually, you know, looking at our faces and we see the audiences because unfortunately in online spaces, um, uh, this is element is always missing or conversations are a bit polarized. And again, for us, it's important to have safe space and you know, this kind of interaction. So we started doing live shows. We also started building coalitions of similar minded storytellers and journalists and people who try to educate the rest of the world about Ukraine. So we coordinate um, on strategies how to do better, how to bypass all those troubles that social media platforms put in our way through algorithms, through censoring and stuff like that. And of course, I mean, at the core of it is still, uh, unfortunately, um, a year, more than a year into this genocide, the idea that Ukrainian voices should be explaining Ukraine at the conversations about Ukraine is still radical. We still see so many spaces where Ukraine is discussed without a single Ukrainian voice is, uh, is presented. So until that is a still a radical idea, is still a thing, I think our job is definitely uh, not done. Well, thank you. We're super happy to, uh, to hear from you directly today. Um, I'm going to uh, open it up to questions from, uh, from the audience. Uh, in the meantime, while we get uh, mics, uh, how, how can we support your work? Like, how can, we, how can people, uh, you said this is a donation base, volunteer base, like, how can we support your work? Yeah, um, it's actually really easy. There's obviously two ways, the monetary way and the information sharing way. Um, we, as Maxim said, are 100% sponsored by our patrons on uh, Patreon, the platform that allows us to crowdfund um, the funding for what we do. Um, you can find information about that on Maxim's Twitter or on my Twitter. Um, and there's different ways for you to support us. We have three, three different tiers that give you different opportunities uh, and different additional things. We do record additional episodes um, for our high, higher tiers. And we also have reading lists if you want to learn more about Ukraine in your spare time. So it's about, you know, deciding how much you want to support um, our podcast. And of course, I mean, for us, number one, what you can do is also listen to our podcast and share our podcast and tell others about our podcast. And um, I'm pretty sure that there's something for everyone in terms of episodes that we have because we cover such a wide range of topics. So as much as you can, amplify and listen and donate if you can. Thank you so much. Do we have uh, any, any question in, in the room? And again, si vous voulez poser votre question en français, vous pouvez poser votre question en français. Ah, we have one question. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I wanted to know um, what are your relationships with uh, other Ukrainian medias and uh, how, what was the reaction in the media industry uh, in, uh, at your launch? Do you have any relationship with them and how does it, does it go with them? Um, I can take that. Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, especially as a Ukrainian journalist, uh, uh, having an experience already of, uh, you know, setting up several startups that specifically had similar 
idea before about explaining Ukraine to the rest of the world. I think this is kind of like a a mission that we saw before many uh, Ukrainian media activated upon in 2014 when the invasion actually started and after the Maidan revolution. Uh, But uh, now so it's even more important because Ukraine victory will not be possible without every Ukrainian friend activated and, you know, helping and amplifying Ukrainian voices. So in terms of reaction, I think there are a lot of uh, people who are trying to do this, uh, the similar educational work. Um, You know, it's a weird situation where you don't see any competition because everybody understands that we are underrepresented on across all boards. So every work that every project does, whether it's just news coverage or whether it's uh, human stories, whether it's different types of content, uh, everything matters and cumulatively we share each other, we coordinate. But as I mentioned before, we started also doing these non-public coordination sessions because you know, I, Ukraine's story is, is, is about the narrative and this, you know, the story that we want to share with the world. And it's complex and it's nuanced and it's, you know, dates back centuries. So it takes a bit of skill and knowledge. How do you step outside the world and try to explain all these complicated things and also to make sure that people relate? And there are so many similar conversations, cultural wars uh, abroad. So you need to also learn a bit what is happening outside the context. And it's also a journey for people. Um, so this is where we try to uh, cooperate, collaborate, uh, find funding opportunities as well to make sure that this is not just, you know, uh, volunteer effort surviving in between our severe burnouts but also something that can grow and sustain itself. So for now, it's a collective effort, for sure. Thank you. Do you have any other questions from the, yeah. Hi, uh, thanks so much for the presentation. I was wondering uh, about the impact that this has on you two, actually, as creators. And uh, if you had more stories to share about what people, what listeners, uh, what it changed in their in their lives to listen to these podcasts. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for your question. I can start, but I know Maxim has a good story for you about uh, how this impacts our listeners. Um, essentially, for for us personally, as Maxim said, I think we were doing it so often in the beginning is because we actually needed it. As, as, as I said, we did it three times a week, right? We did it, ep- season one was three times a week, then we went down to two times a week, and now we're doing it, you know, once a week. Um, but for us, it was just so important to have something stable in our lives, something that we knew was happening at a certain time on these certain days that we could come to and that we could talk to each other and to our guests and to listen as well, not just talk, but I think it was so important to add that little bit of structure that allowed us to open ourselves, um, that in terms of impact, you know, it's very hard to describe impact and measure impact and all of these things. But on a personal level, it's been sort of like that anchor, I think, for us. Um, And the other thing is also the fact that through this podcast, we met so many incredible Ukrainians that we wouldn't have otherwise that really like, I think, I mean, it's going to sound cheesy, but it sort of changed our lives because a lot of these people have become our friends we talk to every day who we you know we support each other we help each other and it's sort of become like an informal network i hate when people say that it's become sort of a family but it like truly has so in terms of personal impact that's it but maxim on our listeners we've had some feedback yeah i mean we always share on our social media because we do have so much feedback and it always like moving and uh, incredibly empowering, especially again, I mentioned we might experience several burnouts a day as Ukrainians doing so much every day. Um, I think on just to add on personal level, for me, it was also important to keep creating something I mean, terrorism because one of the reasons terrorism you know, is aiming at is to make sure that you're broken and you feel pain and anger 
and so many emotions and you cannot do anything. So for us, it was important to take all of that and keep channeling, channeling into something that we can build. The relations, as Valeria said, that we're building, the awareness, the education. So you take all that trauma and you try to resist with creating. And this is in incredibly important even for our guests. Again, they come on some days and they feel, and they say, you know, I don't feel like I can have this conversation. All I want to do like is cry or I'm so shocked at what I saw today. And then we're having conversations and they are being reminded what they're doing is important. But when we started inviting guests who are not Ukrainians, Ukrainian friends, uh, at first we were a bit, um, you know, hesitant, you know, whether it will be something that will be relevant in for Ukrainians and for topic as well. But then, uh, you know, one thing when you invite people with a similar experience of Russian colonization, for example, from Central Asia or Eastern Europe, but then we started inviting uh, people from further places like Taiwan or South Sudan. And we had such a fantastic uh, guest from South Sudan, a famous human rights and justice activist who spent over uh, a year in a torture cell. And we, you know, we were talking about his experience, how he survived through really horrible dark times and he shared his story. It was powerful, but then, you know, someone who survived a Russian torture chamber in the East after that episode, they wrote to uh, me saying that they cried over the story and it not only was similar to what they faced there, but it also gave them hope that if that person, you know, built his life back and, you know, speaking on behalf of justice, even strong with stronger voice, then it's probably something that they can do as well for themselves and their people. So, you know, all these bridges are very unique and special. It doesn't have to be just Ukraine related per se, but these and of stories of resistance and survival. This is something that absolutely we cherish and we're proud that we're amplifying them. Thank you so much, um, Valeria, Maxim. Thank you so much for, for your time, uh, for sharing your, your story, the story behind the, the podcast, but not just behind the podcast, like what you're trying to do, uh, in, in amplifying Ukrainian voices in the, the, the storytelling uh, and the coverage of everything that's happening, uh, and also helping us, educating everyone around, not just what started uh, in 2022, but the uh, much more important, larger conversations that uh, we all need to, to have and, and to understand um, uh, around uh, Russian coloniz colonization. So thank you so much. Uh, your podcast, Ukrainian Spaces, is available on most platforms. Uh, and, and you have a Patreon as well, a Patreon page, which is where people can, uh, can support you and, uh, and, and, and donate to, uh, to the effort. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Slava Ukraini. Stop. Acting so small because you are the universe in its static motion.